the biggest, if you like, personal change uh, was, hey, I've got to not be an asshole. Um, it was when I'd been on Who, on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I was I was very young. I'd started at the age of 26. I was a very fast animator. I did I did more animation than any other animator on the show. Right. So I I was very arrogant about that. I mean, when I use the word arrogance, I I, I am aware that that was actually absolutely. I I, I got a bad reputation. Uh, there were a number of people who actually seriously hated me as a result of my behaviour on that film. I was watching some of the behind the scene featurette of uh, Bible Goes West, American Tale. Oh, and, Lord. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that, actually. I don't yeah. it's, I kind of avoid watching those things. It's, yeah, it's that, sort of... <laughs> that's why I said, who, who watches that, right? Because you don't. Uh, but, you know, it was interesting that time and how, but one thing that I found very consistent was just, I think you still are the same person that you were back then based on what I saw, which is really good. It's, it's, <laughs> is that know. good? Is that a good thing? I'm not sure. I think so. I think so. Uh, in some ways, I think it's, we all change, obviously, but yeah. that overall persona and everything kind of, you know, stays somewhat more or less the okay. same, which is good yeah, to I, see. I, I look at photographs of that here and just like, oh my God, we were all so young. We, I, I mean, Five Goes West, we set up a studio. I think the average age of the studio was about 26. We we had no idea what we were doing. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And which, which you, you already told me the story about, you know, how uh, Spielberg sort of asked you to direct. Um, and I, I was watching the featurette and um, I, I saw the film a while ago. I haven't seen it recently. I was watching the featurette and how the, the lady, I don't remember who she was. She was talking. It's like a news report type of featurette that how she was saying that you know Spielberg decided to open up an animation studio in UK because you couldn't compete with this Disney in in the states. Well, and, it was also that there was a there was a whole crowd of animators that had worked on Who Framed yeah. Roger Rabbit who yeah. hadn't at the end of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. A lot of the like lead animators were offered jobs at Disney um, and. Some difficult and argumentative people like me didn't take the offer, and sensible people like James Baxter did. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there was uh, the, then there was all of the like the junior animators and the assistants and in betweeners and all the other stuff who weren't offered the chance to transfer. So you know, it's quite evident there was a huge talent pool in London that wasn't being kind of used in features. And uh, cause you know, there'd be a feature film every, every two or three years that would get made, yeah. you know, when the wind blows and things like that. Um, and they made some really good stuff, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't being used. Mostly it was commercials. We had a, it was a huge commercial operation in London at the time. I I'd started doing commercials for Dick Williams before he got headhunted for, for Roger Abbott. So, um, and and in fact, my my wife started up a small commercial studio and did a, a bunch of commercials while while we were doing uh, um, uh, Five Goes West and uh, and we're back in Balto. In fact, I know some of the people who were working in our studio were moonlighting for her. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's interesting you mentioned that James Baxter went to Disney and you went to Amplification, but at the end of the day, both you guys ended up at DreamWorks. You know, it's, it's, yeah. It's, well, it's... <laughs> James came to DreamWorks. The weird thing is, James came to DreamWorks because of uh, the films they were going to make. Um, yeah. He he was offered much more money to stay at Disney. Disney literally said, "Look, we will we will offer you buckets of cash." And he said, "Yeah, you know, I'm already making enough money. I I want to work on things I'm interested in working on, which I I I have enormous respect for because cash is is scarily attractive, you know." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Uh, you know, going, going, going to an American tale. So the first one, uh, Don Bluth, who directed that, came out in nineteen eighty six, and the second one came out in eighty nine, which I think was the same year as Who Framed Roger Rabbit, if I'm not mistaken. Or uh, no, no, no. Uh, Roger Rabbit came out in eighty eight. Eighty eight. Uh, actually, we started work on on Five All Goes West in 89, very beginning of 89, and it actually came out in, I think, 91. Really? Yeah, because I think it was 91, and then We're Back came out in 93, and Bolter came out in 95. I think I am either I misread it or IMDb. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, I misread it. 91, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, that I, makes I, more I, sense. Because I, I, yeah, we I, I um, finished work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit uh, in kind of I am trying to think um, early in eighty eight. I did some commercials for like Burger King and stuff like that using you know, with the Roger Rabbit characters. Uh, and then I did a bit of work for Passion Pictures um, uh, later on that year. But yeah, I I, I know okay, uh, that that who uh, who framed Roger Rabbit came out in '88 because that was actually also my wife and my honeymoon. We went to New York <laughs> for the uh, for the premiere of the film as as part of our honeymoon. Yeah, I think I'm mixing it up with the Back to the Future, but you know, go, oh, yeah. going go, going going back to uh, what my original thing was that Don Bluth had directed all these films uh in the in in the world of disney like you know in the 80s and the 70s and even before there was all disney it was always disney yeah and, and then you know he, then he uh, made he made uh banjo the woodpile cat basically in his garage and that resulted in being able to get the financing to do um what was it uh um, secret, of Se- secret of nim right yeah. and uh and secret of nim attracted spielberg's attention which is why they then did um uh, the, the the first uh, American tale with Bluth. Mm-hmm. Then after that, they did Land Before Time. And Land Before Time, uh, from my understanding, I was not connected to it in any way at all, but my understanding is that um, the relationship soured somewhat. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, when Bluth actually delivered the film, um, Spielberg and uh, Lucas looked at it and said, we can't release this film. And they radically recut the thing. I remember talking to James Horner because he'd scored it already when they did the recut. And he ended up having to patch together bits of his score using synthesizers to connect one bit to another. The whole story order was completely different. I, I, I don't know the film that well to be able to talk authoritatively about it. But um, it, it, it it was very different. And, and there was a lot more violence and stuff in it that... Um, uh, Spielberg and Lucas, I think, probably quite sensibly said, "This is not going to fly with with parents." Yeah. So, um, uh, so that was kind of the end of the relationship with Don Bluth. So then, uh, you know, they were looking around. Spielberg wanted to carry on working in animation, and he was just looking around for like, what are we going to do? And uh, I don't know whose idea. Robert Watts was involved in um, in sort of spearheading setting up the studio in London. Mm. I, that that answers my question because I was curious how Don Bluth wasn't even involved as an EP or in any capacity as a producer. So that that makes yeah. sense. Um, you know, what was it like being given? You know, Don Don Bluth is such a big name, uh, even at the time. Like to counter somebody like Disney, even though he had worked at Disney on films like uh, I think Rescuers and Pete's Pete Pete Pete's Dragon and mm-hmm. a bunch of other stuff. And to kind of take that and this be your first film, obviously, you know, you were not the only director. You had you had a partner in crime. Still nibbling as well, yeah. yeah. But just taking on that and just (laughs) diving into something that is completely dominated by Disney and maybe Don Bluth. What you have to understand is my appalling level of ignorance married with an, an outstanding arrogance that I had at the time. You know, there I was, I, I, I was like 28 when um, you know, Spielberg asked me to do this. And I thought I knew everything. You know, I, 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 I thought I can do this. I, you know, I've directed lots of commercials and, you know, I'm a decent enough animator and, uh, and you know, Spielberg and Zemeckis and people like that all think I'm great. So, of course, I can direct a film. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, truly, the the, the level of of um, <clears throat> the level of both ignorance and arrogance uh, astounds me now when I look back on it. I I shouldn't have had anything like the confidence that I had going into making that movie, and um, you know, <laughs> the uh, comparatively low quality of I mean the movie actually weirdly there's a lot of fantastic work in the movie I think the story overall kind of sucks it's not it's not but I I didn't understand the first thing about story not at all it was it was amazing so um and and actually for many many years my my kind of technical understanding of how to do like how to put shots together and how to do animation and and how to get 
like you know animation performances far exceeded my understanding of kind of what makes a good story or why a film is worth watching you know i i, I just didn't have a clue about that <laughs> but i think that's everybody simon uh, you know it, obviously uh, with everyone that comes at different stages and being young you have to be you have to be in somewhat you know arrogant if you want to call that and you have to show confidence because otherwise nobody will believe in you but having said that um everybody has that like i know it all i mean you and i've talked about this like how i thought i would be able to i directed my first feature doc i'm like i don't need to hire an editor i'll just do it myself and then you learn and then you just hire <laughs> somebody oh, else after this is this is why we pay editors a lot of money exactly. it's actually really hard to do yeah. <laughs> well every aspect right and now yeah. uh even though I have always sort of loved narrative and that's always been my thing, now I'm getting into the world of narrative filmmaking and the things that I'm learning as we go along, even though I thought I knew them, and I'm sure I will find more about them, you know, on production. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can study everybody else's work. Yeah. But when you actually sit down with a blank sheet of paper in front of you and like, well, I've got to tell a story from the ground up, it's, it's a whole lot more interesting. <laughs> it is. But, but but my point is, I, I don't think you should beat yourself about, about, uh, around it because it's just part of your growth. Oh, if that's yeah, it. yeah. I mean, I I'm just astounded that you know that people did believe in in me and Phil and actually gave us gave us the money to not just make one film but three films. And as I like, oh man, it it was. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you a story. I took this uh, uh directing course. I would like to guess probably 10 years ago, this gentleman named Peter Marshall, he had been AD on a lot of films in Hollywood. Uh, I don't remember which films it was, but he had been AD mm -hmm. on a lot of films. And he told us a story about, he says, he said, I'm not going to name the name of the director. I'm not going to name the name of the film because otherwise you'll know. He goes, mm -hmm. there was a film uh, where the director was hired first time and on his resume and in his interview, he was just full of confidence. Like he knew what the hell he was talking about. And on the day of the production, he got cold feet and he had no idea what the hell to do. So in order to save the face of the production and to keep the production going, the AD, first AD, Peter D. Marshall, he directed the entire film, but the director got the full credit. Yep. <laughs> so, and I don't know what happened to the director afterwards, but I mean, the, the story, it, it it's something that I guess that confidence sometimes gets overblown and, and then it backfires on you. But in your case, obviously it hasn't, you're still around. Well, I, I, I've survived. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't do a lot of directing these days, but um, part of that's through, through sort of, I, I, I have actually turned down a bunch of things that I was offered at DreamWorks because just like, I just don't have the, I don't have the dedication to put like three or four years of my life into into a story unless you know unless I really really want to do it now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I directing is really hard. I, I don't really recommend it to anybody. It's like you know, it's a thing you should only do if you really really have to do it. <laughs> you know, I I, yeah. I think I sort of I was chasing being a director at first just because I liked the idea of like I'm I. I'm a Hollywood film director. I like like that idea. Um, I I don't know that I had a particular drive to tell stories. You know, weirdly, I I have much more so now. I'm more interested in that. And I, but at the same time, I only really want to do the stuff that I do. I I find very few projects that I read and go, oh man, I want to I want to direct that. You know, just that something else, some, somebody else has written and developed, and I look at it and go, "Yeah, that one I could direct." So it's not that you don't want to direct. Is it more so, perhaps, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, like the pressure of a studio and just being completely? I mean, that happens in any production, but is it something else than that, or is it just is it too much, too much pressure? Is that? I I think I'm lazy. I... <laughs> You know, I I, uh, I don't think that's uh, true. But. <laughs> um, yeah, it, but it, it is. It, it's the um, yeah. It's an enormous amount of of effort and commitment, and sleepless nights, and you know, stress, and all those things. Which um, you've got to really want to see that film on screen to make it worth doing all that stuff. 
um, versus mm. you know I I can I can make a very nice living storyboarding for other people and uh, and not have to worry about it and it doesn't keep me up at night so um, yeah I and and in terms of directing like just directing for hire I, I I'm not. It's funny, I've had that discussion. I remember having that discussion with um, uh, Kevin Lima, who he really wanted to get back in the directing chair. He liked being in the directing chair. He liked that kind of, you know, getting to play with all the toys and getting to to um, to work with actors and all the technical people. And uh, yeah, he, he, he missed it. And I... I, there are parts of it I, I really enjoy. Some parts of the filmmaking process, and other parts of the filmmaking process are hard, and uh, and I've had varied experiences with it. So it's not like all of my experiences have been wildly positive. I mean, if if I'd had more experiences like making Mars Needs Mums, um, then yeah, I'd probably be I'd probably be missing directing because that was a, a truly joyous experience and i love all the people we worked with and it, it was great and uh and if i could go back and do that again i would uh so yeah i don't know it's a bit of a mm. it's a bit of a mixed answer sorry not very clear there <laughs> no 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 it, it, it's fine um while we're on that subject do you do you i know it's been a long time but if you can recall on uh, american tale five will goes west when you realize that oh crap this is way more than i expected it to be and how am i gonna go through that and how you came over that do you do you remember that time at all um no because it kind of didn't happen on on five oh, okay. west it, it, it was um it, it sort of that's more of a gradual realization of the space okay. of i don't know probably 10 years um, oh, okay yeah i i think the um uh there, there were parts of making Balto which uh I I by that point, yeah, kind of the stress was getting to me. Actually, I I, I took up transcendental meditation during Balto because I was suffering from uh sort of such severe stress that I was being sick at mo almost every weekend. I, I'd make it through the week and then I'd spend the weekend, you know, curled up with with stomach ache and uh and actually throwing up, which uh, eventually, you know, I, I did a whole lot of medical checks and had, you know, a barium meal and x-rays and all of this and to find out if I had like a rumbling appendix or something like that. And it turned out to be completely psychosomatic. So I, I guess, yes, the, um, the, the, the weight on my shoulders was actually starting to register. Um, but I think it was starting to register if you like subconsciously, subcutaneously, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing where I was actually sort of thinking, oh my God, I've got all this work to do. I was just kind of, uh, I, but I, I think part of me was very aware of it. Yeah. Mm. What was something that you learned in American Tale, Five Will Goes West, that you took it to We're Back, Dinosaur Story, and from there to Balto? Um, well, actually, probably the, the biggest, if you like, personal change uh, was, hey, I've got to not be an asshole. Um, it was, when I'd been on Who, on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, I was, I was very young. I'd started at the age of 26. I was a very fast animator. I did, I did more animation than any other animator on the show um, by, a, by a factor of about 50%. I mean, Phil Nibbling was averaging 11 foot a week. Um, Andres Deja was averaging eight foot a week. Most animators were averaging five or six foot a week. I was doing 16 foot a week. And that's not my numbers. That, that's, that's the numbers that the, the, the staff were tracking. Right. So I, I was very arrogant about that. I mean, when I use the word arrogance, I, I, I am aware that that was actually absolutely, I, I, I got a bad reputation uh, and um, uh, there were a number of people who actually seriously hated me as a result of my behavior on that film. Plus, I was kind of a favorite of, of Dick Williams and of Bob Zemeckis, the director. And I'd fly out to the US and do storyboarding for Bob. And and um, and I was clearly in Dick's confidence. And, and so, yeah, there was, there was a good deal of quite well-based resentment of me in, in the studio. And then, so we we come to try and 
I, I, I go off and actually I, I uh, storyboard on Back to the Future 2 and 3 um, at the end of 88. And, well, actually, it's the beginning of 89. And then Spielberg asked me if I'd be interested in helping set up the studio and doing Five or Goes West, which I, I, I actually I wasn't sure about. And I, I, I talked to Bob Zemeckis about it. And I actually remember going in because I was on my way to a meeting when mm. Spielberg waylaid me and so i then go on to see bob and say stephen just asked me to direct a film and he said well you're gonna do it right and i said I, I i don't know and he said come on you direct a film now you're a film director then people will listen to you and if you have a film you want to do people will pay attention you got to do it simon so it's like oh i guess i got to do it then um but come trying to set up the studio there were a bunch of people who wouldn't come and work at Amblimation because of me. And when I... Interesting. Yeah, because, <laughs> because I was an asshole. And, and so I suddenly realized, oh, I've got to, I've got to really seriously change behavior. I've, I've, got to, I've got to treat people better. I've got to, you know, not think so much of myself and, and, and so on, um, be more respectful. So uh, that, that, was, that was a big change actually going into... Um, into Five or Goes West and the whole amblimation experience. Um, but no, I, I think probably, to be honest, all the films, even Balto, I, I didn't really understand how much one is supposed to shape a story and how a story takes shape. Uh, I very much relied on, on um, kind of what the writers would create and then Spielberg's notes. And, and to be honest, Spielberg's notes were generally about filmmaking things, not about story things. Mm. Um, so uh, in a way, I, 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 was, I was trained to think more about the filmmaking than I was about the storytelling. And it wasn't really until I came out and started working on Prince of Egypt and worked with Brenda Chapman in particular that I really recognized, oh, this is, this is actually what filmmaking is about you know i i brought a lot more in the way of cinematography and and technical understanding uh to that film than brenda did but brenda was you know head and shoulders above me in terms of understanding how to shape and create a story and uh i i, I learned a great deal from her from that experience but then <laughs> didn't apply that at all when I went off and did Time Machine. Um, and that was partly because I was working with Walter Parks, who um, very much yeah. was fingers in the pie. Um, and and in fairness to Walter, I didn't know a lot about what I was doing. So, um, you know, he, he was stepping in and, and filling, uh, filling that void. And it really was at the end of... Uh, time machine that I started thinking I need to understand more about storytelling and so I actually mm -hmm. started started with that blank sheet of paper and started actually writing things and and trying to figure out okay how does how do you construct story how does story end up being a you know a satisfying thing and yeah. wrote, wrote a lot of bad scripts before writing things that were halfway decent yeah but here is my question, though, right? Like, so on an American Tale, Fowl Goes West, you had a, a partner in crime. On We're Back, a dinosaur story, I think there were three or four directors along with Technically, you. Technically, there were four directors. The way that, that worked out was actually um, Phil and I had started uh, that film, and then uh, the opportunity to develop Cats, the Andrew Lloyd Webber film, came up, and we didn't want the Zondags to do that. We wanted the Zond we, we said we, we want to direct cats. Um and the Zondags brothers, uh Dick and Ralph Zondag, uh took over um We're Back. And uh eventually Spielberg wasn't very happy with how that had all gone and also uh, the whole cats thing fell apart. Mm. Um and and that's a million stories as well. But um uh, and 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 Phil and I were asked to come back and and kind of fix we're back with no time and no money. Um, and actually, what we had started developing Balto as well, Phil and I together, 
And um, the decision was made by by Amblin that the smart thing to do would be to split us up and have me direct Balto and Phil stay with We're Back and, and sort of see that the right way through. Right. So Balto, you directed by yourself. Like there yeah. was not, you know, you can't say that going back to what you were saying that, you know, you didn't know what you were doing in terms of story because Balto, I remember watching it when it first came out probably not around the same time, but maybe a few years later, I really liked it. And I was probably like 17, 18. And I, I I don't know why you would say that you didn't know what you were doing when you were the only director directing it. If well, in, fact... in, in terms of constructing story, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's still it, it pretty was good. A, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was a well-constructed story in script form. You know, in the, in the early version that Phil and I read, we looked at it and said, this is a movie. We can see this as a movie. This this is, uh, you know, it has a satisfying ending. It, it's kind of inherent in the story. It's going to be a satisfying ending. The um, the dog that saved Nome, Alaska, you know, it's going to have a triumphant ending. Um, uh, there's, there's a bunch of stuff in the movie that I think probably could have been constructed better. It, it's it's a bit kind of lumpy in the the journey. Um, and I think there's there's elements like Jenna who we didn't really develop and use properly. Um, there's a lot of ways I look at the story of that film and think it could have been done better. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a pretty satisfying story. And it's one of those movies that uh, I'm, I'm constantly surprised how beloved it is, uh, particularly like my children's generation um that uh they you know they grew up with this as being one of the films that was regularly put on you know the 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 VHS or the CD uh the DVD of it and um and so yeah it's surprising how many people i meet now and like young storyboard artists and stuff i work with who go oh my god that was my favorite film when i was a kid uh which is is really nice it's really satisfying yeah but um and there are elements of the film which I am I am enormously proud of. I think the the look of the film is is really remarkably good for it the is. budget level, um, yes. and and there are things that we were very smart about the use of of effects work and stuff like that when we had a very limited budget on how much visual effects work we could do, and yet it feels very full and complete. Um, and and just so, yeah, I mean, the, the backgrounds, most of the backgrounds which were painted in oil paints because that captured the kind of luminescence of, of, of uh, snow and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, overall, I'm, you know, I'm pretty pleased with it as a film. I'm, I'm very pleased with the, uh, the love it's held in by so many people. But, you know, could I write it better now? Yeah, probably. Of course. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's anybody. Anybody would do something better, whether it's a film or it's running a company or hiring somebody. Yeah, or I letting guess that, go that is true. So yeah, I, I I felt that Balto was a reasonably good movie, and it's a thing that at the end of the day I was proud of. Um, See, the, where, yeah, go on. I, I, you know, when, when I'm when I'm honest, I kind of wish I'd taken my name off. We're back. I don't like the movie, and I <laughs> I don't know that I have really that much authorship of it to to even have my name on it as a director. So, um, you know, I, I, I directed on it for maybe like a year of its three year existence. And so, yeah, yeah that's one third of the film right there. Well, not really, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but, but, but you anyway, know, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's, so I'm telling you my perspective in the nineties. So a lot of people, if not all the people, when it comes to animation up until the eighties, I would say, you know, the first thing it would automatically be it's Disney. Right, yeah. like it's Disney, and then Don uh, Bluth came into the picture, and then you know, uh, Secret of Name, All Dogs Go to Heaven, uh, Land Before Time, yeah, Five O, uh, uh, Balto, we're back, and I don't know about other people, but for me, I got, I I was just a huge fan of you know back in the day we used to call them cartoons, right? Like you know, mm. the Saturday Saturday morning cartoons or whatever <laughs> films were there. Uh, I was very fascinated with the fact that there is another, I, I didn't used to think in so many words, but it was like, there's another team in town that is yeah. trying to tell stories in animation. It wasn't really articulating at the time this way, 
But it was just like, oh, this is something I have to see. They must be really good that they're competing with Disney. And I, and yeah, it's not I, you just know, a it, monoculture as well. It's like, it, yeah. yeah, it's it's like there may be other flavors out there. Yeah. And I wonder not to take anything away from Katzenberg or DreamWorks Animation. I wonder if there was no Don Pluth or other animation uh, features or shows, would would it ha would DreamWorks have been the way it came out in the early nineties, uh, sorry, late nineties and early two thousands? Because they really Don Bluth really set up the platform, including yourself and your your colleagues and everybody. Well, well, on a really practical level, um, we would not have been able to do Prince of Egypt had Amblimation not existed, because there you go. Uh, easily half of the staff of uh, Prince of Egypt, at least uh, at the beginning of the show, uh, were were our crew from London. We moved 120 artists over from London. Um, and we had been working together. Many of us had been working together for five years by then or four years by then. And um, and so uh, I, I, mem I remember Katzenberg really being surprised by the quality of the artwork that the European artists could do because he'd, he'd sort of imagined he was going to be able to, I don't know, you know, uh, poach a lot of people from Disney and drag people in from other areas. But, you know, Disney was the pinnacle as far as he was concerned. And then he started seeing the kind of stuff that uh, people like Christoph Sarand and William Salazar and Rodolf Gwenaden and Patrick Maté and people like this, they were doing this um, uh, amazing, amazing, brilliant animation. I was like, oh, wow, maybe maybe Disney aren't the only only good animation yeah. people in the world. Um, so yeah, I think I think Katzenberg was was surprised by that. So yeah, in a sense, you're right that DreamWorks wouldn't have been able to come out of the gate, you know, at full speed, um, had uh, had the those European studios not existed. And so yeah, I I, I think that's a that's a reasonable point. Um, and mm. yeah, I, I mean. All of this, I think, to be to be honest, uh, an enormous amount of it comes back to Richard Williams, because Richard Williams, um, back in the '60s, uh, was a kind. He was a person who really kind of kept the flame burning in London and probably pretty much in Europe. Um, he'd studied under the you know the Disney people. Uh, he he'd you know gone and got. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, like Grim Natwick and um, uh, sorry, um, Art Babbitt uh, and Milk Carl. He, you know, he'd studied with these people um, and 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 absorbed as much as he could. And then he was he was just disseminating that to anybody who was prepared to come and work and and study under him. And so his commercial studio was the thing that kind of. It kept the knowledge. It was, you know, it was the Library of Alexandria. It was, and everybody mm. fed off that. And because, frankly, Dick had a, a somewhat explosive personality, people would come and work for him for, you know, three or four years, and then generally leave and go and set up their own studios. Um, but uh, yeah, he he was, uh, you know, I, I most of what I know about animation, the actual art of animating comes from learning from dick and uh an awful lot of animators i know you know that's that was their way in and yeah you know people like eric goldberg who's like you know a lion of the industry now yeah <laughs> where was he uh what 40 years ago yeah he was working for dick williams wow 40 years seems like a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell me about uh, it <laughs> Um, uh, you, you talked about cats and you, you said there's a whole big story around that. Is that something you're comfortable talking about? Because I obviously have no clue uh, about it. With, with, with reservations. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> whatever <laughs> you're comfortable there, with, there, there are, there are stories and there are jokes and stuff. Um, I have to tell you a joke, which I heard, which sure. is in, there's no authority to this at all. So, so Spielberg, um, has a, an apartment in oddly enough, Trump tower, and uh, and he notices in the other people who have apartments in Trump Tower, there's Andrew Lloyd Webber. And so he calls up Andrew Lloyd Webber and he says, Andrew, you're like the most successful uh, musicals producer 
in the world, and I'm the most successful film producer and director in the world, we should do a movie together. And Andrew goes, well, I, I don't know. Um, how, how much do these movies make? And Spielberg said, well, my film uh, E.T. grossed $400 million at the box office worldwide. And Andrew goes, I don't know, hardly seems worth it, really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, that's entirely apocryphal. It did not happen. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm sure, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> but but no, they got talking and and the idea came up to do this as an animated feature, and uh, they got I believe it was Richard Lagravenez to uh, write a script which was actually a, a really good script. It, it managed to weave the because uh, basically Cats Cats as a show has almost yeah. no narrative. It is it is a series of characters. Um, it, it's a series of character um, cameos held together loosely by this concept of the heavy side lair and and the you know one person will be chosen and uh which works very well by the way for a stage show it's a tremendous stage show it's run forever it's made all kinds of money um but in terms of a feature uh I, you know i think the gravna is very sensibly said this needs more of a narrative through line and um and and you need to feel like the characters each of these characters contribute something to the journey uh, and so he put this together and i don't think andrew read the script and we started doing you know storyboards and and sending them to spielberg we were at the same time negotiating our contracts but um phil and i naively continued working um john napier who was going to be the production designer who had several meetings with us and was a very nice guy um he absolutely vehemently refused to do anything until he actually had a contract and he was the sensible man in all of this um after about five months or six months of work um i think Andrew finally looked at something that, you know, some of these storyboards and hated it. He just absolutely hated it. And um, uh, and there was a big summit meeting at Andrew's house uh, in, um, in West London. I'm trying to think which square, but it, it doesn't matter. But anyway, you know, he has a magnificent house. He has a grand piano in his hall, you know. Um, and uh, and Spielberg is at one end and Andrews at the other, and 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 they basically completely failed to communicate or come to any kind of conclusions. And by the end of the meeting, we all knew, well, that's it. The movie's over. It's dead in the water. Um, and I I think you know they had very different views about what the movie should or could be, and. Spielberg comes from, you know, the narrative storytelling point of view. And Andrew's point of view was that this is a fugue and it's a, it's a piece of music primarily. And the songs go in a certain order because they have, you know, a structural reason musically for being in that order. Uh, I'm not sure I entirely understand his argument, but that, that's what he claims. Um, and, and therefore, uh, you know, any, any reordering, such as had been done in the script was was anathema. Um, so I, I think it was just, you know, worlds colliding. Or, or actually worse than that, it wasn't worlds colliding, it was worlds completely failing to come anywhere near each other. <laughs> you know, yeah. worlds missing each other by a million miles. Um, so, yeah, and and, uh, and then Phil and I had a struggle actually getting paid for all the work we'd done on the, on the show, uh, which was another painful experience. But... But anyway, um, we, we put that behind us and moved on yeah, to, yeah. Uh, you know, finishing off with back and doing Balto. But, and yeah, that but, resulted and that resulted into about 30 years later to make to get Cats the movie made in which I don't know if anybody watched. I haven't seen it. it uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I have seen it. it um, there are lots of things about it that are, are not good. Um, a lot of choices that were made, which uh, I don't know how 
Andrew Lloyd Webber felt about the film. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I have a certain level of resentment of of my experience on on trying to make it. So yeah, there's there's a level of sort of Schadenfreude about like yes, other people took it on and they didn't really fare much better either. So, uh, but you know that that that's me being mean and petty and I shouldn't. So. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. And it's funny you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you talked about Spielberg's and Andrew Lloyd Webber's meeting and how they were looking at two different things, you know, musical versus narrative. And it just reminded me, uh, the uh, there was a play by Andrew Lloyd Webber, Evita. Uh, and uh, I think Tim Rice said the lyrics. And the movie with Madonna and Antonio Banderas, I think, was coming out in 1996. And the way they marketed the film and everything, and keep in mind, I had no idea who Andrew Lloyd Webber was at the time um, mm -hmm. and what theatrical musicals are like. So I go in, I sit down, and I'm waiting for dialogue, and the movie ends. It gets, it's an entire musical, right? Like the yeah. whole movie, if my memory serves me right, it's an entire musical. And it it didn't work for me. Like I, I just, I, I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand at the time. And I think... Not to take anything away from musicals, they're very now. If I watch it, I'll probably appreciate it more. Uh, but at the time, I think that idea of narrative, even now, is necessary. I mean, Evita did have narrative for sure, but it was just mm. at the same time the musical element in there. I don't know if it sits well with the audience to watch something that is completely musical or almost without a narrative. Yes, because right? I did that also with Jesus Christ Superstar, which uh, yes. I, I'm not not terribly keen on the film. I love the original the original recording with Ian Gillan's uh, doing the voice of Christ. And it works really well purely as a musical. You don't need any dialogue in between the songs because the songs sort of fully illustrate it. I, I mean, you know, however I feel about Andrew Lloyd Webber, some of his musicals like like Jesus Christ Superstar are extraordinary pieces of work. They are they're really marvelous. Um I I think the uh the film is sort of interesting and I and I think my my main objection to it is I just didn't really like the singer who did Christ because he just didn't compare to to Ian Gillen. But um anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. There's like a pure musical where there is no narrative. There's no uh sorry, no dialogue, dialogue. at all is is kind of I, I mean it ought to work it ought to be possible to make that work um you know as i say it works on stage so but i think there's a different audience for that though right yeah. like pe people who go to theater it's different audience as opposed to people like the masses they'll come to see movies the masses don't go to theater yeah um, and, and you're, watch you're, plays. it's also you're expecting a different experience yeah 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 100 yeah. um, so, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've never been a huge musicals fan. It's not a thing, you know. I don't, I don't go out to a lot of musicals, and I don't know a lot of musicals. So, yeah, same know, here. I, 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 I'm not really, I'm not really a qualified person to to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you most recently worked on Kung Fu Panda Four. Correct. That's the last film that I I worked on that's actually come out. Yeah. Yes, that's a come out. Actually, uh, oddly, no, no, wait a minute. There's actually uh, there's a film that's come out since then uh, called Ultraman, which, um, oh lordy, I've forgotten. Oh, it's called Ultraman yeah. Rising from um, the Netflix. And yeah, and I actually storyboarded stuff on that like four years ago. <laughs> um, oh wow. Uh, and and I, apparently I have a credit on it. So because um, uh, somebody had seen it and said, oh, I saw your name in the credits of this film, Ultraman. It's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But actually, uh, after a little bit of kind of triangulation, I realized, oh, it was called Super Baby Daddy when I worked on it. It was like its working title. So um, Super Baby Daddy to yeah, Ultraman. But anyway, uh, I, I, yeah, I need to see it. Well, yeah, I didn't know. I, I've never heard of it even on Netflix. It's a, it's a Jap Japanese science fiction media franchise. Um, yeah, it's apparently, yeah, seems, seems um, interesting. But, but, a, I gotta... but an American director. Um, yeah, and of course, and I've forgotten his. You, you've got it in front of you. I, I, I uh, his name has slipped my mind. I'm embarrassed because he's a great guy. It's um, created by 
it's a Japanese guy. Let me just look on IMDb. No, that's 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 not the movie. Um No, hold on. Uh, creators. Let me go under directors. Oh, Jeff Nimoy or Kenji Shinji Aramaki. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong series. No, <laughs> no it wasn't a series. Oh It's no! just it's a feature. It's a feature film, Oh, not the series. okay, okay. Hold on, Ultraman movie. Ultraman is in U L T R A M A N, right? I think so. I, no, that's not Yeah, coming up. you know. But... <laughs> I hope you're going to edit this out of your, your final release. Yeah, I, I will. I will. <laughs> Watching I will. us look things up on the computer. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, Anyways, sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 hang on. I can find. I can find out because I can look up. Uh, uh, I mean, you should know what you worked on. <laughs> well, I know, but I, I, I've worked on on so many things. I know. That, I know. I'm uh, just kidding around. Uh, what if I search under those terms? Yeah, oh god, it was it was twenty seventeen when I worked on that show. Holy cow! <laughs> so it is the one that I was talking about. Uh, Shannon Tyndall. Shannon Tyndall was the, the director. But it is is it Ultraman series on I, Netflix? I, I, is... No, I think I think it's a it's the it's a feature film, not not a series. And I think it's called Ultraman. I think it's come out under the title Ultraman, but you know. Let, let, let's IMDB Shannon and see what uh, what the latest thing he's had come out. What's his full name? Shannon? Shannon Tyndall, T-I-N-D-L-E. He was the director of uh, Kubo and the, and the Three Strings and... Uh, Oh, Kubo and Two Strings. Yeah, Two okay. Strings. Sorry, whatever. Ultra, yeah. Ul Ultraman Rising, it's called. Oh, okay. So it is Ultraman, but Ultraman Rising. Rising. Okay. Well, apparently I worked on it. Yeah, like actually seven years ago now. So. <laughs> and it just came out this year. Yeah. Happens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And and you know, going to Kung Fu Panda Four, I I still haven't mm. seen it. I haven't had a chance. What was, what was your experience on working some on something that sort of been out of, you know, the first one came out in two thousand seven, and I think the second one came around mm -hmm. two thousand ten, and the third one maybe a few years after. I I, I but, worked on all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a long gap, right? Uh, before this started, sort of. Yeah, kind of I don't back. I don't particularly know why there was um. There was a time when they were thinking about rebooting the franchise and doing it as a uh, a live action animation combo thing, where where um, Poe would come into sort of the human world, or at least there would be a world which real human actors would interact with with animated characters. Uh, I I I don't know the wisdom of that one way or the other, but um, yeah, th this. The the final version that got done, uh, I think Mike Mitchell came on board to start directing it. Might have been during COVID. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, I've I've worked with Mike Mitchell many times over the years. I've I've known him uh, must be 15 years or more, and uh, no more actually, more like 20. Um, so yeah, it was it. it there's a there's a bunch of animation directors I have very comfortable uh, experiences with because I've worked with them either you know in parallel to the time when Mike Mitchell was you know still drawing storyboards and and uh, um, so yeah it, it was it was a, a good experience in that you know Mike trusted me he could he could launch me on a sequence confident that you know I was gonna. I was going to deliver what he was after. He he's very good at communicating what it is that he wants and and kind of his vision for how a scene should play, um, and and you know open to suggestions and ideas. So yeah, that that whole thing it it's a it's a very good working experience. Now, you know, a lot of what you do ends up getting cut out. That's the nature mm. of of storyboard for animation. You, uh, I, I think it was Brenda who said. You know, everything you draw is on explosive bolts. It's just any moment, just 
boom, it's gone. Yep, that's no longer in the movie, or that's going to be rethought and restaged, and somebody else may take it on and change it all. So, so there's a whole lot of stuff I did for the movie that didn't end up in the movie, but um, a great deal of the there's a whole battle between um, the chameleon and Poe, and I mm. boarded a, a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, it, it was. I, I think I probably worked on the show for somewhere between four and six months, something like that. I, I, I tend to move around quite a lot. I, I'm I'm a very expensive storyboard artist, so I, I get shuttled from show to show. So I typically I, I, I storyboard on maybe four movies a year. Kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation then to the end, would you have imagined... 40 years ago or 30 years ago that you'd be doing what you're doing right now at DreamWorks as a storyboard artist and that's something that you'd be excel excelling at and probably one of the most expensive storyboard artists like it was something that um, you probably I, I, I could actually in a sense take it back further than that I, I you know when I was 7 years old what I really wanted to do was draw pictures and if people would pay me pay me money mm. to draw pictures I, 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 I have in effect um, ended up with the career I dreamed of having when I was seven years old. Now I didn't know storyboards existed. I used to, I used to draw little, you know, cartoons in the corners of all of my textbooks and and uh, or at least my rough books. And uh, you know, my parents were very concerned because I I wouldn't concentrate on my schoolwork, but my my books were always covered in these these little drawings, and they were always they were always storytelling drawings. They were always drawings where something was happening. It wasn't just like oh, here's a nice bowl of flowers. It's yeah. always, you know, somebody's kicking the bowl of flowers off the table and it's about to land on somebody else. That, that you know, it. so <clears throat> I, I kind of imagined I was going to become an illustrator and maybe comic books, but I had no idea how you get into comic books, but I had some idea that you could be an illustrator. So that was sort of what I had originally envisaged. Um I, the whole film directing thing wasn't something that I had dreamed of doing at all until it, it kind of, uh, I guess actually until um, until seeing the first Back to the Future. When I saw the first Back to the Future, it's like, oh my God, I've got to work in film. I, th this is the stuff I ought to be doing. And then a little after that, it's like, well, if I'm going to work in film, maybe I should be the director because the directors are the most important people. Um, you know, um, But uh, yeah, I mean, I think until until I started working in commercials in 84, I didn't even know storyboards existed. I didn't know what a storyboard was. And until working on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, I didn't understand how storyboards worked in feature films. Um, and until really working on Prince of Egypt, I didn't understand the kind of the Disney story process of how you develop a film and how you keep reworking the storyboards and, and revising and changing it. And, you know, because the, the amblimation stuff, it's like you pretty much, you storyboarded it. It went into production. You didn't do a lot of storyboard changes. Um, uh, so, you know, what I do for a living now, I, yeah, I, I get paid to, to, to sit on a couch and draw funny pictures and, and uh, that pays my mortgage, which I'm very happy about. And, and you know, the nice thing is that now I'm in a position where I get to, you know, I get to choose who I work with. I don't have to work with anybody who comes along. Um, and I, I also I find it, I find it's actually, I, I haven't really found many directors I didn't like working with. Uh, and a lot of that's to do with the fact that, you know, I, I, Early on, I always say to them, look, I've sat in your chair. I don't want to be sitting in your chair. I'm not trying to take your job. I am here to deliver whatever it is you've got in your head. Frankly, I'm not even going to judge what your ideas are. They may be good. They may be bad. I will make them work. They will show up on screen. They will sing. They will be pieces of cinema. Now, you may look at it later and go, well, this doesn't work in the story of the movie at all. And you can cut it out. And that's fine. I've already been paid. You know, <laughs> I, I, I've i done so much of this now. I really don't mind if my material gets thrown out and yeah. other stuff replaces it or I get asked to revise it, whatever. You know, when, when I was a younger artist, I was very, you know, 
very possessive about my work and I still see, you know, young storyboard artists who, you know, gripe about the fact their stuff gets changed or, you know, it's like, no, that's, that's the job. You know, you, you, you come into a story team, uh, check your ego at the door because it's not about you. And, um, you know, if your stuff ends up being in the movie, then great. Or you may have just helped get them to the place where they needed to get to in order to tell the story properly. And, and you may have done that by showing them a whole lot of ways they didn't want to tell the story. And that's OK, too. That's just as useful. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it, it is a hard change for young artists who... You know, you, you draw pictures, you paint pictures, you create things, and you have a love of the thing that you've created. And to, to get to a place where that is dispensable, that is disposable, is, is emotionally very hard to, to develop, it's, uh, to get that kind of thick skin where I don't mind, I don't care. I mean, I, I care, I care enough to do a good job, but if that then gets thrown away, I'm not... I'm not grinding my teeth and gnawing my knuckles with with rage and frustration anymore, yeah. which I'm very glad about because that was a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, but I think that comes with time, right? Like uh, also with yeah. a lot of work, like if you keep yourself, if you get, end up getting a lot of work eventually, then you start realizing that, okay, I'm not that you know, I'm not that special for the lack of a better word. Like my work is not that special. Yeah. It's just, oh, it's and, and, and believe me, I still find this uh, to this day that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite in demand as a story artist and people uh, respect my work, which is nice. But I, I also, I belong to story teams. And I mean, just yesterday, uh, a guy called Dave Walter, who is um, quite an experienced story artist, uh, delivered a sequence for this movie which was, it used a lot of very extreme anime kind of filmmaking uh, techniques and conventions. And it was hilarious and breathtaking and a completely different take on the scene than I would have been able to come up with. And I, I looked at it and went, man, okay, I, I'm challenged by that. You know, uh, Dave has done something that right now I couldn't do. And um, so maybe I need to I need to step up a bit and do something a bit more remarkable. Yeah, <laughs> it's a healthy competition. Which is great. Right? It, oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's terrific. I, I love that. It, I, you know, uh, actually, I've been very lucky in the last couple of movies I've worked on that um, the story crews I have been with have been kind of all the A-list storyboard artists that DreamWorks have, partly because they haven't got a lot that's at that level of development so they've just been taking this whole this gang of, of four or five of the top artists and just moving them from one movie to the next um and uh and that's yeah i there's nothing better than than the feeling of um oh man i wonder what catherine raider is going to come through with i have to make sure that what i'm doing is as good as it can possibly be because I don't want to be overshadowed by her because <laughs> yeah. I will be because she's really good or, you know, what's Rob Koo going to deliver? It's going to be hilarious and brilliant. And, and you know, I, I've, I've got to work hard. Yeah, that, it, that's is pretty nice. much that's pretty much what it is. It's all about just topping your game. And sometimes, I mean, a prime example of this is like, you know, Disney versus DreamWorks, right? Like Disney was ruling... The world in terms of animation, Lion King had come out, Toy Story had come out, and then when DreamWorks landed in, you know things kind of got shuffled. Like you know, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they had uh, and and Disney carried on making some very good films. That, yeah, and 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 not every movie DreamWorks made was was of that course superb. But um, yeah, I mean, right now I'm I'm. Selfishly, very glad I'm working for DreamWorks. I think they're making some very good films. Um, and I think they've got a couple of films that are going to be extraordinarily good. Um, I'm really looking forward to Wild Robot that comes out. And oh. I, I, I have I have absolutely nothing, no knowledge of it all. I, did, I didn't work on it. I, I'm actually kind of resentful to Chris Sanders that I didn't get to work on it because I, I've worked with Chris on a couple of movies. And uh, uh, it's like, dude, why did you not employ me? But... Um, 
but yeah, watching that trailer, it's like, I know. holy cow, I, that film looks like it's going to be something really remarkable. You know, it reminded me when I was watching it, I felt like I was watching Iron Giant yes. in a way. Yeah, it, it, it and... looks like it's going to have that same emotional whammy that Iron Giant yeah. had. Yeah. Um, and because Chris, Chris does charming like unbelievably well. He, he, his, uh, you know, his personal drawings have charm just oozing out of them. And somehow he has, he has a very like puddling around in wet clay kind of working technique. He's constantly changing and fiddling with things. But what he comes to at the end uh, is extraordinary. Uh, it, it can be very frustrating working with him. But at the same time, he ends up with something where you go, yeah, okay, it's worth it because it, he's doing something. I don't quite know what the alchemy is that he, he uses to create that. But um, yeah, I, just from the trailer, you look at it and go, this is going to be a tearjerker. You know, I'm going to yeah. be that connected and involved with this. I think it's going to, I think it's going to make a good amount of money and i also think it's gonna dominate the award season i, I, I just I, I can just feel it like looking again it, like looking it, at it just kind of has that smell about it doesn't it yeah, yeah. it does yeah. it does there's just something um, about it that that it clicks yeah. and and uh, as i say the, the, there's a couple of movies i'm working on at the moment unannounced which uh have uh the the you know the work i'm seeing that's getting done on it just in terms of story development uh, is amazing and um, oh, wow. and by contrast, I have to say the last few movies out of Disney have not been great. And Pixar I, too, I would say. Uh, yeah, I, at least yeah. I at least I would they, say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Pixar make reliably competent movies, even when they're not like blockbuster amazing movies. Although, yeah, I I I think. Uh, there was there were things conceptually wrong with with Lightyear. I think it in itself it wasn't a bad movie, but it it, it if it hadn't been connected to to the um you know the the whole Toy Story franchise, but because it is yeah it it was disappointing. Um, now I mean it was it was a well made movie for and of itself. It wasn't it wasn't bad. Um, where I, I, I've got to be honest, and I'm really sorry to say this, but I just did not think Wish was a good movie. I, you know, oh, yeah. In in any in any frame, I'm afraid, and and I feel bad saying that because working in animation, you know, there's like three or four hundred people who have put you know years of their life into these movies, but um, I, I mean, I, I sort of, I'm afraid, I felt about it the same way I felt about some of Don Bluth's later movies, where you know, you look at them and you go, all that work and effort in pursuit of that, you know, that sort of disappointing concept was it's just, it, there's a level of outrage, I feel, on behalf of the artists. But I think that happens in sports, in films. We, we all go through this arc ourselves, right? Like where we feel like we're ascending and we get to the point and then we start taking it for granted to some degree sometimes. And then we start going down yeah. and like, okay, we got to wake up again. And, you know, it's just yeah. like... But there's this kind just... of ebb and flow of like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And look, you know, I, I, I also have to, you know, have the humility to recognize that I haven't made any films that have been enormously successful. So who am I to be looking at something like Wish and saying, well, that's not a very good movie. It's like, well, yeah, what have you done? Well, you know, you're an audience <laughs> member too, right? So you're well, yes, I, sure. Um, yeah. uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I do recognize that, um, you know, I, I, as a film director, I haven't had a particularly successful uh, career. And, and so it's hardly for me to, to look at other filmmakers and say, well, you know, what you did is, is lousy. But um, but yeah, I, I th there are films you come out of like I I remember going to see Zootopia under uh, under extreme pressure. I did not want to go and see Zootopia. It's a bunch of like 
what I term cats in pajamas. It's it's like it's just fluffy animals dressed up in in human outfits, pretending to be things. And I, I I've done movies like that. I don't like them. And my kids dragged me along, and I came out of Zootopia feeling that may be in my top five animated movies of all time. That was an incredible, brilliant movie. Yeah, it was. Um, and so you know, um. I, I, and of which, by the way, I'm professionally enormously envious, you know, um, but, uh, yeah, so, so, um, movies can totally can, can win me over, but, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 wander off into the wilderness there. It, it's completely okay. I, I do that all the time. Um. Yeah, but it's 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 great, you know. Thank you so much, Simon, for joining in. Let's let's talk. Keep talking when the films are announced, and maybe whenever they come out, we will have more to talk about. I always have a great time talking to you. It's always oh, a pleasure. Likewise, yeah. So good Wonderful. to talk to you too. Okay. All right. You, you take care now. All right. Bye. See you.